Hey everybody, welcome. We're just clearing the lobby and getting folks into uh, into the meeting before we start here in just a second or so. So if I'm sitting here awkwardly pretending to stare at you, wishing I could see your faces, that's 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 actually exactly what's happening right now. So um, just want to thank Paul Gallagher from our team for doing the organization around this with our, our partners at Microsoft, and um, really looking forward to, to the discussion today. So I think we're I think we're at a point where the recording is rolling, and I just wanted to share that in case you do not want to be recorded. Uh, this is meaning that you would need to exit at this point. Uh, we are going to share this publicly afterwards, uh, which is the reason why we're recording it. Uh, and uh, and we hope that that still serve as a good resource for, for all those in the market that are learning about the topic at hand. Uh, so, without further ado, it's three minutes past the hour, and I think we'll we'll go ahead and, and jump in. So, uh, happy Thursday, at least in the time zone that I happen to be sitting in right this moment. I know others probably already crossed Friday. Happy Friday to those of you. If you happen to be awake right now. Uh, I'm Dan Lamont, and I have the Good fortune of being one of the team members at Threshold.World uh, and one of the co-founders of the organization as well. And today we are going to uh, have a deep dive conversation about the common data model for nonprofits. And I'm going to do a very brief introduction of the two esteemed guests uh, that I have with me here today. Uh, Amy Schneider, who comes to us from Hopewell. Amy's going to get a chance to tell you all about herself and her role in the organization a little bit later. And uh, Mr. Chris Zimney is here from Microsoft Tech for Social Impact as well. You'll also get a chance to hear about Chris's role and, and what he and the organization are doing at Microsoft later on. Uh, they will uh, do a much better and fairer job than I will of doing introductions. So I'm going to let them do that for themselves. Uh, but the planned agenda for the day is to do uh, uh, the brief introductions that we're doing right now. Then I am going to share uh, some background on the Common Data Model for Nonprofits, or CDM for shorthand. It isn't the only CDM that's out there, but for the purposes of today, we'll probably use the term CDM quite a lot. Uh, and in, the, in that context, we're definitely referring to the Common Data Model for Nonprofits. And uh, and then Amy and I are going to have a brief discussion uh, about Hopewell, and uh, and then Chris is going to take over and talk about Microsoft's stewardship role and the partner ecosystem that's developing around the common data model for nonprofits. And then of course, uh, we're going to open it up for questions, comments, and anything from uh, those of you that have, have graced your presence today. So let's jump into the CDM. Um, if, uh, for those of you that haven't met us over here at Threshold, uh, we love stories. And so we're going to start off with a story. So uh, we have a picture on the screen and uh, one number that we hope will resonate with you, which is 1,435 millimeters. And I'll come back to telling you why that's important in a, in a minute or two. Uh, but if we roll the clock back a bit to the first Industrial Revolution uh, around the year 1800, uh, the first industrial revolution is about halfway through its process. Uh, things were progressing very rapidly, uh, mining for coal and other metals in England and Spain, the United States, Russia, and many other countries around the world was in full swing. Uh, and uh, it was really a fever pitch of progress. And at that point, those raw materials were critical for fueling that progress. It was a time of, of great movement of people, of goods and materials. And uh, believe it or not, railroads became one of the key ingredients to making that possible. They sprung up all over Europe, um, again, in, in places like Russia and the United States. And the issue was that if you want to move goods and services around and you want to do it between different places and, and notably across borders, you would hope that all those tracks would be built the same way and that you'd be able to move those materials efficiently across those borders. But what actually played out was that in places like England, the tracks were four feet, eight and a half inches apart. Um, and it was mostly the same in the, the majority of Western Europe. Uh, and uh, But in places like Spain and Portugal that didn't want places like England and others meddling in their business, uh, their tracks were five feet, feet and six inches apart. So if you wanted to cross the border from one of those countries to another, you had to stop the train, take everything off the train, move it across to a different train, put it back on the new train, put that train on the new tracks, and then keep it moving down the path. 
So this was true in places like the United States uh, and Russia, who hired a U.S. engineer to come across. They built tracks at a certain gauge, and this played out across the rest of the Industrial Revolution. Why did this take place? Uh, competition, right? People wanted to set a standard. People wanted market share. And the result of that was that there was inefficiency, that time was lost, there was unnecessary competition. Um, there was a lot of repetitive work, repetitive work and, and progress ultimately was slowed. Uh, and it took, believe it or not, another 86 years for the majority of the tracks, the United States alone, to be put into the same gauge and for everybody to agree. And actually, it made a lot of sense for us to use the same size train tracks for, be, for us to be able to move goods and services around. You're probably wondering at this point, why does Dan keep talking about train gauge and, and railroad tracks? Well, the use of data and the potential for data to unlock change in our world has followed very much a similar process. And so the concept of a common data model has been around for a very long time. Um, but the common data model for nonprofits address, uh, attempts to address this challenge. Over the last few years that we've been part of this discussion, there's been a lot of uh, debate about what is a common data model and who has a common data model. And so I want to start off just with a little bit of background on, on what is a common data model, and then we're actually going to get into the common data model. For so a common data model is a shared data language for business and analytic, uh, analytical applications to use. And that shared data language, if you remember anything from today, is probably the very best piece for you to remember because it sets out exactly that core kernel of what the CDM intends to be. Um, it all includes things like tables, fields, metadata, and relationships. And it may or may not be focused on a specific industry. So in today's case, we're going to talk about the common data model for nonprofits, which is why that four gets tagged on at the end. But there's also common data models for healthcare and, and other industry segments. This second part is probably the second most important piece I'm, I'm going to say today. So if you remember anything, this is it. Uh, a common data model is not an app, right? It's not a finished user facing product. It's not ready to go out of the box. It is a design. Right? And it can be manifest in technology. Uh, Chris is going to talk a good bit about that today uh, from Microsoft's perspective. Amy's going to share examples of that at Hopewell today. But CDMs are not apps. They are not technology. They may be manifest in technology and they may describe it and be described in technology like Excel documents or entity relationship diagrams, et cetera. But if somebody tells you that their product is a CDM, it is not. The output of a CDM is that it makes it possible for data and its meaning to be shared across applications, the simplifying the creation, aggregation, analysis, uh, and application development overall. What does that mean? It really means it should be easier to share data and it should be less expensive for us to be able to build things that, that make things work and solve problems. And the intended outcome of that is that it should save time and, and expense, improve interoperability, and hopefully, uh, this is one of the things that people often forget, it should really improve the morale of the people that we get to work with because they ought to be able to use that shared data language to communicate better with each other about what the challenges are going to face. And our hope, I think all of us here uh, would say our, our real hope is that we're trying to apply this knowledge and these talents and use our voice to be able to improve lives and livelihoods of all of the species that are lucky enough to, to call this planet home. So that's what a CDM is. So to recap, you know, it's a shared data language and it's not an app and it's ultimately an intent to try to improve lives and livelihoods. When we apply that ideology to the common data model for nonprofits, what we end up with uh, in our next picture is, Paul, if you would click us forward, if you don't mind. Thank you, sir. Uh, the common data model mo for nonprofits is a technology independent, there you go, that shows up again here in the definition, design that includes industry standard definitions for can things like constituent management, fundraising, grants and awards, program delivery, uh, program design, as well as impact tracking. There's a blurred picture on the left-hand side, which is inten in intentionally looking that way, uh, which shows you the core CDM. <clears throat> and the core CDM is a series of tables, fields, metadata, and relationships 
that describe how those different components can and probably should interoperate with each other. And ultimately, they follow the flow of funds and activities through a cyclical system uh, to try to bring about change in the world. And that core CDM is a single solution that includes uh, a host of different tables, fields, metadata, and relationships to bring about those, those capabilities. And it can be, again, manifest in, in different solutions to be able to accomplish those aims uh, for the benefit of end users. There is also, within the CDM for nonprofits, an optional IOTI add-on. IOTI, uh, if you're not familiar with it, stands for the International Aid Transparency Initiative. And it includes two key standards uh, that are called the organizational and activity standards. Uh, and the uh, S is in that, not a Z on purpose. That's not a typo because IATI is often uh, and principally developed with uh, international development organizations in mind, uh, which uh, and in its own authoring uses an S instead of a Z in, in organization. And the IATI organizational standard really follows the flow of funds from one organization to another and to another. And the activity standard uh, brings together results tracking across different implementation activities so that organizations, uh, whether they're funders, participants, and or uh, those that are actually engaged in the services themselves can follow the flow of funds and activity throughout the system to improve transparency and, and ultimately learning in that context as well. So the if you want to put uh, some numbers around the CDM, you can think of it roughly, and I'm just going to give you rough numbers because if I give you specific ones, uh, you won't remember them and I probably won't either. The CDM includes about 100 tables and about 1500 fields that describe those different functionalities in the nonprofit context. Um, and if you look at them in aggregate, you might be overwhelmed by the fact that, that there's so many. But the reality is, is that when the CDM is interpreted by different parties for inclusion in solutions, there's really about 10 of them that matter the most. And so if you wanna dig into the CDM and wanna follow up around what those key anchor entities are that really uh, allow for the translation of interoperability across systems, uh, there's lots of experts out there in the CDM community and with organizations like ourselves and the rest of the partner community that Chris is gonna talk about in a little while. So uh, looking forward to, to covering more of that in a little while. So hopefully this is giving you a good taste of what uh, the CDM for nonprofits actually is constituted uh, with. And I would love to uh, jump forward now and get a little bit more real with our friend, Amy, uh, and, uh, and talk about how, how does this get applied in the real world and what change might it bring about in that context. So Amy, if you would do us the honor of, of introducing yourself and hope well, and then maybe we'll ping pong a little bit with some questions. Absolutely. Well, thanks for inviting me, Dan, and it's really exciting to be here and talking to everyone. Uh, my name is Amy Schneider. I'm the Vice President of Program Impact and Strategy at Hopewell. We are an organization uh, in Massachusetts that is focused largely on working with children and families that are connected to the child welfare system. And we also do some work with adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We are a nonprofit that has been around for over 50 years but um, really just in the last few years have started to try to make the transition from being an organization that um, we believe does really good work, but not in a very consistent or cohesive or documented way uh, to figuring out how to make sure that we can be a learning organization, that we can measure the work that we're doing and uh, use the things that we learn from data to evolve our work so we can better support kids, families, and adults. Oh, Dan, I think you're on mute. Somebody had to do that. It might as well be me, right, Amy? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, thank you for the introduction. I, and I would uh, strongly encourage everybody who's participating here today to, to hop out and take a look at Hopewell online and learn about the programs at Amy Stewart's with the rest of the team there. Um, it's really exciting to, to get to know you and to hear more about the programmatic work that, that you're, you're in, um, involved in delivering. You talked a little bit about, you know, thinking about this transition and uh, things like relational databases. Like, what, what, what was the trigger or the key triggers inside the organization that that got you thinking about, you know, we need to get this data better organized? Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that for the for everybody who's here today. 
Absolutely. So um, we're an organization that was uh, founded by someone that was really innovative and thoughtful um, and did some really incredible work and brought on some really incredible programs um, and then passed the organization off to somebody that was a really strong business person, really focused on making sure that the organization could stay sustainable. And we had some very strong contracts with the state of Massachusetts and with Connecticut. And um, they were really just focused on delivering uh, what those contracts required. And when the CEO who had been in his role for a very long time retired, a new CEO was brought on, uh, Shahir Mustafa. He's been there now for uh, six years. And when he came on board, he knew that there was a lot that we needed to do to make sure that we could really capture and understand the work we were doing well and reporting out to the state on, but figuring out how to actually report internally in our own system so that we could capture the data and do something with that data. Uh, right now, most of the data that we collect actually just goes in the state systems. We can't really pull reports on it. And it's not the work that really tells us about whether kids and families and adults are thriving, uh, which is what our mission is about. It's really data that's focused on child protection and safety. And this is not uncommon in my field of social service um, to really be focused on the things that we're being paid by the state to do. Um, and we believe that's not enough. And we think that there needs to be a paradigm shift for how we do the work and that we are advocating for others to do the work this way as well, that we need to really be looking more holistically at the supports that we can provide. Just because someone's in foster care doesn't mean that keeping them safe is sufficient. We really wanna make sure that they have every opportunity to thrive. I think that's that ideology is manifest in your title itself, right? And the combination of the kind of three keywords that come together around, you've got to deliver the programs. You're really focused on, you know, forward looking and, and the whole picture around impact itself, you know, which is made up of outcomes and outputs. Uh, but you've got to be really strategic because you want to, you want to be in the best support system that you possibly can, right? So you got started on this journey with a solution that's got the CDM at the core of it. What, what is, what specific problem is that solving? And then where do you see that from a broader vision perspective? Like, how do you how do you think that that data is going to be able to power and help power the, the team uh, and, and the work that you're you're doing as as the VP? Because it's going to fall on you to make sure it happens ultimately. Right. Um, and, and how does that how does that that starting point help, you know, lay a path uh, for the broader vision that you have? Sure. Well, as I'm sure it won't surprise anyone that is familiar with this field, um, there's not a lot of data sharing that happens across systems at all. So we actually um, started building a CDM for our newest program, which is tutoring and educational supports for children that are experiencing foster care. And we're going to grow the CDM eventually to cover all of our programs. But um, the child welfare system and the school system in the state of Massachusetts are not very well connected. And the schools don't always know when the children that they're supporting have been impacted by the foster care system. And the child welfare workers are in a position to want to care a lot about the schooling for children, but needing to be so focused on uh, child safety and their very, very over uh, capacity in terms of the people um, and the kinds of things that they can support. And so what we intend to do is to be able to use the data that we are gonna collect through this CDM to assess whether this brand new innovative program that we've developed is effective and adapt it to make it as effective as possible. Use that data to advocate within the state legislature to push to have a program like this funded for all children across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts so that they can all get the academic and educational supports that they need so they have the best opportunity for thriving. And to use what we learn to be able to show the importance of having an integration in data between the child welfare system and the education system. And I think there's a lot of people in Massachusetts that want to be able to talk across those two systems, but there's you know, it's very complicated to make these large systems that serve a purpose for those particular uh, governmental agencies to communicate in all the best ways. And so we think that we can be 
um, flexible in a way that government systems can't. And if we can prove concept and get people excited and on board, then there's an opportunity to convince people that there's more opportunities. And we think that we can do this in Massachusetts and eventually, hopefully, across the rest of the country as well. So big visions, but um, we think it's possible. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I can't wait to see it happen because it's, you know, the, the combination of like getting the core data together to deliver results and demonstrate efficacy, but then translate that into advocacy and then scaling advocacy. I think we've seen, you know, in today's world, it seems like it's more possible to be able to make those translations happen when people have a better understanding of the evidence and the, the context that's wrapped around it. So it's uh, one little nugget that's in the middle of this is that that's really neat about the design is that it's it's principally based on the common data model for nonprofits, but because it's about tutoring and education, there's been components of the common data model for education that were borrowed and designs that were borrowed that were incorporated because you're effectively tracking that educational process that comes through. So, you know, we're, um, we're, I think that's a great innovation of what you have driven in part of the work. And I think it's exactly what these CDMs are supposed to, to show up with is, you know, uh, did, did you have to think through like a course architecture, you know, as in the context of, of uh, fundraising and so forth, which is, which is on the roadmap as well. So do you feel like it saved you time and effort and energy in the design and implementation process in this first phase? Um, do I feel like which part saved me time? The accessibility of CDMs to be able to bring about this, this implementation. Ah, yeah, great question. So, um, so to answer your question in a little bit of a roundabout way, so my personal experience using database systems has largely been with out-of-the-box solutions. And in fact, we're using one in one of our programs. Um, we have a program uh, called My First Place, which is for youth who have aged out of foster care. We're an affiliate partner with First Place for Youth, which is an organization out in California, and we implement their model to Fidelity. And they use uh, Apricot, which is a social solutions database yep. system. And so we've been using that. And it is hard to access the data in all the ways that we want to. And the data doesn't relate to, uh, pieces of the data don't relate to each other in the ways that we want them to. And I've had that experience when I've been at other organizations as well. And so then there's an entire team of people that are needed to be able to pull out of that data the information that you need. And mm. so this has been a lot slower in developing than I think it would be if we took an out of the box solution. But I actually think this is going to allow us to set the foundation for what we need for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years so that we can develop something that evolves with us. So if I understand this correctly, and the technical piece is not my background, so you'll jump in if I've got this wrong, but we put a lot of time and energy in the beginning into understanding how all the different pieces of data needed to relate to each other. And then the thing that the user is interfacing with is just that, it's an interface that allows us to access that data. And as the capability of these Microsoft tools changes and evolves, then we can change and evolve the way people interface with that data without having to start from scratch, map everything from one out of the box database solution into another and lose lots of information in the process. So we're putting a lot of time and energy in now and it's challenging and mind bending sometimes. And there are moments where I'm like, what are we doing? Um, but I think that this is actually gonna be so much better for the long run um, and allow us to grow this to all of our programs. It will allow us if we expand as an organization to take on additional things that we don't even imagine that we're gonna be doing at the moment. And it will allow us to layer on some really important tools like Power BI and things like that, that will allow us to analyze our data in ways that we can't even envision at the moment. So we're very much at the beginning of the process, but it feels like there's a lot of potential. Yeah. So that doesn't quite answer your question, but. I think you nailed it in a much better way than I asked it. So, and it's in it, and I think it's a great example of how, you know, if you put that work in, in the, in the front, then it can really set you up sustainably in the long term, uh, and also leverage these other ecosystem applications that they may or may come and go as, as time goes on. So, um, Amy, I want to say thank you very much for sharing your story. I hope there's going to be some good questions for us as we get to, to Q&A, but I want to turn it over to Chris to talk a little bit about how 
how did the CDM for nonprofits thing happen and uh, and where might it be going from here and who's who's involved in in stewarding it going forward so Chris welcome it's good to see a good friend here and I uh, can't wait to hear what you're going to share with us go for it thank you uh, and thank you Amy that is the work that Hopewell and you are doing is truly humbling and and inspiring I mean it's um uh, I'm blown away. So the idea that that the vision that you have is at the center of that is is built on the common data model, data model for nonprofits is, um, you know, really incredible. Uh, and thank you, um, and thank you, Dan, uh, and the team at Threshold for being, um, you know, a key contributor to the design of the common data model for nonprofits and such a strong advocate uh, for the nonprofit and partner communities. Uh, so one of the things that, well, I should, before I jump in, I said who I am. So as Dan mentioned, um, I'm, I work with the Tech uh, for Social Impact team. Um, I work specifically on the partner innovation team within, within Tech for Social Impact. Um, so as a team, we focus on creating the, uh, the ecosystem of partner apps and integrations that bring the common data model for nonprofits to life and meet the needs uh, of organizations like Hopewell. Um, and so looking at the slide, I was, I was so excited about it, kind of jumping in there. Um, it, having, having participated in some of these design discussions with nonprofits early on um, and talking about what the needs are, talking about, you know, trying to think in the background about how that's possibly going to be met with technology. How would we model that data? How would, you know, we potentially bring in data from other organizations and, and uh, to, to, to enrich it and meet the need. And now looking at this slide and, and thinking and knowing that um, the design of it, the design of the common data model advances those discussions so quickly to, you know, to, to, to talk more immediately about the functional needs and the problems that the nonprofit has, right? Um, and it's not a conversation about technology. It's, it's what are the functional areas that we need to bring together um, to meet the needs. So we have uh, the start of this journey, right, with the with the common data model for nonprofits. And the beginning of it was um, um, recognition that uh, in order to have the broadest impact possible the, for these for these technology investments, um, we'd have to start with that common data language um, that is technology agnostic and relevant and consumable um, by any nonprofit or or partner organization. Um, there were a series of subsequent investments, um, nonprofit accelerator, uh, to to really assist and, and bring, um, make it easy and and sometimes this the scheme when talking about data schemas and models and things can be a little abstract, um, and so this accelerator included a series of sample apps and things that could really that allowed you know uh, um, users and, and nonprofit um, folks to to visualize what that ends up looking like for uh, really quickly for their, their users and constituents. Um, additionally, uh, um, we have invested subsequently in the fundraising and engagement um, application, which um, meets the, uh, the needs and the demand for fundraising, for especially for systems that manage fundraising in light of the, the pandemic um, that came up where many event, a lot of things went offline. Right, um, uh, offline activities, I should say, went needed something to manage all of those efforts, all those fundraising efforts. If they were using um, inadequate tools, that really knocked a lot of fundraising offline for the entire the global nonprofit community. Um, fundraising and engagement as an application uh, was released to to not only extend uh, uh, the common data model for nonprofits, but but bring some better tools to them to support nonprofit uh, support fundraising. And then finally, um, following all of those investments, uh, we've led to the Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit. Well, so Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit um, is a modular architecture that brings together all of the previous investments in the common data model, the nonprofit accelerator, fundraising and engagement, and in integrates them into a broader set of products um, from Microsoft uh, that 
represent most of the tools that um, nonprofits are using today. And so um, not only is it, uh, it, it, it is there to, to bring together, right? A lot to enable a lot of the productivity from basic, basic capabilities that nonprofits rely on to run, right? And communicate in, in terms of tools and collaboration um, and integrates them into the nonprofit specific tools, all built on common data model for nonprofits. Uh, so partners have been integral to the entire process. Um, uh, partners like like Threshold um, and partners like all of those that you've seen here have been uh, with us every step of the way from the design. It's been influenced um, by partner community and uh, not, uh, nonprofit um, community itself. Practitioners and leaders from nonprofits have have been with us every step of the way to validate not only um, ensure that the investments that we're making. Uh, are, are are truly valuable and useful, um, but that we have the support of the partner ecosystem behind it. Um, and uh, we can't do it with without them. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. I think it gives a you know great overview of how the initial challenges around inability to to communicate across different data channels and solutions. And Amy, you talked about that as well. Um, you know, came from the sector and, and Microsoft stood up and took a stewardship role in the process. But throughout the, the entire evolution of the CDM as it exists today, as well as the Microsoft solutions, which are, are committed to remain based upon it, uh, has really been a sector driven initiative, including you know actors from across all of the different types of participating organizations, uh, partners, competitors. Uh, you know, customers, prospects, uh, organizations that have never had any intent of using Microsoft technologies, but are, are found founded all of their tech on other platforms, uh, subject matter experts, you know, people from all different geographies and, and so forth. So, um, and thank you for the kind words about Threshold's contribution to it. I think we, um, those of us that were lucky enough to be in the room for some of that design, were uh, really consider it some of some of probably the best and most fulfilling work we'll, we'll ever do, uh, especially because the the whole ethos behind the CDM was ensuring that it was available to everybody and that it was out and uh, and then anybody could take the lessons from it and consume those into their own solutions, whether they were building products on different platforms or full stack platforms or just on a customer by customer basis. And and Chris, I know you have some experience with that in the past of developing solutions on it uh, prior to joining Microsoft directly. So, so I uh, I want to um, just see if there are some questions. So I'm going to jump over to the chat, and I see we got one from Rob Arnold. And Rob said, uh, Paul talking about the CDM being consumable, and it seems like an, it's an area of challenge. Uh, can you please expand on what resources help the technical staff, like DBAs and data analysts, make good use of the data model? And how can you better, perhaps, better connect the team to the model? This is a question that's actually, I think, come up since version one. And uh, there is a, a slide at the end of this presentation, and I think Paul is going to try to paste some of those links into the chat here. This is kind of our recommended short list of places to go if you want to self-service around the CDM. And uh, we've seen a, a whole host of different methods for consuming the CDM to go solve problems. So, some people just go do it themselves, leveraging these and or other resources. Uh, other people will work with partners that are in the ecosystem that have knowledge of the CDM or, or perhaps building products on the CDM or are lucky enough like us to be able to work with teams like Amy's uh, to be able to go define specific solutions. Uh, and uh, we uh, engage in advisory services and or pro bono activities to, to be able to help ed educate people on, you know, how might you use the CDM? How might you align solutions that you already have to the CDM to try to be able to do, do what, you know, do whatever it is you've been doing faster. Um, Amy, I don't know if you have any recommendations from a, uh, you know, and a, a nonprofit perspective, but were there, did anything come up in the work that you and the team have done or otherwise that you found useful uh, from a, a, a CDM knowledge perspective? Hate to put you on the spot, but I don't want to throw it out there and get your opinion. Sure. I mean, I think the one thing that's become really clear to us that we're working on now after doing this very small pilot before launching into doing this for our entire organization is that 
Um, you know, we're a, a relatively small nonprofit. Um, we haven't had in-house technical staff or IT staff. So we have a consulting group that we work with that, you know, make sure that we have our security, keeps our cloud going. I'm probably using all the wrong words, but, you know, nope. helps us buy our laptops, et cetera. Um, and the work that we did when we partnered with Threshold to build the pilot was really challenging because we don't have the back end support to be making sure that we're sort of translating appropriately between what we need from a program side and what we need on the technical side. So the Threshold team was amazing, but we're realizing that to do this holistically, we're really going to need someone in house that intimately knows the, the CDM side of things and can help translate to Threshold as a consultant around what we need and, and sort of be the day to day point person. So I'd say that was the biggest learning for us. Yeah, I think that's huge. Amy. Thank you for sharing that. And I think um, I think one of the keys that we found in the last few years working around the CDM is that uh, it you don't have to agree on all of the shared the the definitions for the shared data language, right? You don't have to say, well, I agree with the designs of a hundred tables, but those ten that are really important, those are the you don't you you can change the labels, but the concepts and the connectivity of those core things are really the the key thing to get your your mind around. So very happy to follow up with your Rob and or others if if that's of interest and 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 dig it into them. Um, looks like there's another question here from Mary. Uh, Mary represents a nonprofit trade association, so it's a slightly different set of applications and needs. Uh, Salesforce and learning management system. Can you talk about your experience with professional associations? Yeah, you know, um, association management and Chris or Amy, feel free to jump in on this too. It, they're definitely a different, there's a different constituent engagement process. Uh, the time relativity of membership and, uh, and participation in associations is really different from, a, you know, from just a standard kind of outright giving or recurring giving perspective. Um, you know, taking into account things like levels and grace periods and so on and so forth are, are really key aspects of that. Um, expirations, renewals, invoicing, all of those kinds of things come up. A reasonable number of those concepts are, are well represented in the CDM. The, the membership capabilities in the CDM are there foundationally. Um, so there's a membership and a membership level capability that's tied into fundraising and fundraising engagement actually has an ad, ad membership functionality that's directly associated to it. Uh, but a lot of it depends on the complexity of the membership models and and so forth. And um, my, my experience with it is, is started about 10 years ago in public media where membership has been a critical feature of their fundraising activities for a very long time and then it extended into other other capabilities too so uh, mary i think there's there is a there are some diagrams in the cdm assets that that refer specifically to the membership model so if that's the piece that you're after that's a really good place to start otherwise uh, feel free to throw anything into the the chat or uh, and or put your hand up and we'll we'll get back to that question and, and dig into it with you for sure so um Kevin's asked the question here about, is there a public facing resource for mapping or wireframing core CDM and IOTI components as part of adopting the modules, including D365? Chris, do you feel like that's one you can go after? Sure, I think uh, one of the references on GitHub, which I believe are on your links there, um, some of the documentation there actually provides gr a great starting point um, and is, is uh, organized by functional area. So it kind of takes, as Dan pointed out earlier, the model itself has many, many tables um, because it covers so many different functional areas. The documentation will, will narrow that to specific functional areas and show you a, a representation of the tables and relationships uh, necessary for that. Um, so. If I'm understanding the, the correction or the um, question correctly, uh, for kind of mapping wireframing core, so there, so that would give you, I would say, the starting point functionally to help you narrow the set of tables. On top of that, there is um, the core metadata reference item three there that is a spreadsheet that is basically a data dictionary. And so, 
it has a, a, a first tab in there that you can actually use to navigate. It's got a tab per entity in the model that is um, that, that that talks about not only it's you know all, all the the schematic specifics for each for each entity. So there's the display names, you know, schema name, basic business rules, relationships, everything is in there. It's yeah. it's really the it's the reference. Yeah, I, I agree, Chris. Up, up through version two of the CDM, there was a mapping guide version of this, the core metadata reference that was published. It ended up uh, being that a lot of people in the community felt like it was it was just an extra asset that wasn't getting used a whole lot, so it, was, it wasn't published after that. Uh, but if you if you look in the GitHub references up through, I think maybe version 2.0.2, if memory serves, I may be off by a couple of points on that. Uh, but there is a, a mapping guide that was was published out there that basically takes takes the core metadata reference, adds five generic mapping columns to every tab, as well as that lead tab that uh, that Chris just mentioned from an entity to entity basis. That that may be a good reference to to check out. So and and I know, I know I have a copy of it around here somewhere. So if you uh, if you want us to follow up with that version and don't have to don't want to hunt through the links, let us know, and I'm happy to connect with you and send it through. So I know we were going to try. I don't see other questions in here at the moment. So I'm going to um, just ask uh, Amy and Chris if you have any final closing thoughts or words of wisdom before I, I wrap us up and, and uh, give people the, the rest of the data. Go do the important work that they're doing. I don't. Just uh, thanks for the invite. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Dan and team and Amy. And I'll just reiterate again that the story here of um, what Hopeful is doing with with the 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 kind of cascading effect of your work and the vision and the and having the common data model at the heart of that is just really inspiring. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Amy, thank you for participating today. I hope uh, hope it has been a good use of your time. I hope your story inspires other people to get started along the journey of of leveraging uh, CDM or CDMs to uh, improve the data interoperability of their solutions at that long arc of, you know, vision of helping people, uh, families and individuals thrive. So we're, we're, we're grateful for the opportunity to get to learn from and, and work with you and can't wait to see where the journey takes, uh, takes all of us and, and especially the people in Massachusetts going forward. So much gratitude to you and the team. And Chris, Always good to be in the room with you and, and learn from uh, the things that you're seeing out in the marketplace, as well as the journey that, that Microsoft has helped steward around the CDM. Uh, and it's just really cool to see the, all, that many partners up on the board, you know, building solutions, working with uh, social purpose and nonprofit organizations around the world to try to accelerate the pace of change. I know that's why we get up uh, out of bed every morning and it makes it uh, really easy to do the work that we do from the positions of privilege that we have and uh, and uh, as is always the case we're grateful for the incredible uh, fair ethical and balanced partnership that we experience in the microsoft ecosystem it means a lot to us and it keeps us motivated to, to continue to contribute uh, both by doing good work but also you know sharing our, our voice and our talents as part of this this uh, systems change effort that we're all doing our very best to contribute to so to both of you and everybody else on the line uh, in the face of many challenges around the world, um, we'll, we uh, wish you all well. We hope you stay safe and uh, really grateful for you uh, choosing to spend a little bit of time with us today. Please don't hesitate to follow up with any of us afterwards if there's things that uh, popped up today that you'd like to dig into deeper our gaps in, in what we shared today uh, that are uh, the things you wish we had covered more deeply. And uh, next time you think about a CDM or next time you see a train track, remember that it's uh, it's it's in all of our best interests to make sure that we're sharing the same gauge so that we can try to accelerate the pace of change and improve our ability to, to make more progress at a time when we need it more now than ever. So I wish you well, Amy and Chris. I thank you again. Paul, thank you for organizing all of this and uh, and have a wonderful rest of your week and weekend. Take care, everybody. Bye now.